way. Move amongst your people. Father, speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray and the church says together, Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Such a joy to be back together, even though we are social distancing. But you know what? This seeking set up ain't all that bad. Some of you might want to be a little further away from some of the others in here anyway. Happy Father's Day to all the dads here. We're thankful for you. We have some great dads in Cornerstone Church. We really do. And I'm thankful for each and every one of you. Um, I'm happy to be back together. I'm happy that we are able to join together again uh, for in-person worship gatherings. We're still missing a few people, but there's 72 chairs set up in here, and there is not that many that are empty. So this is this is great turnout. And we're going to try to continue as safely as possible. Um, just a few things while I'm thinking about it, some of our, some of our rules during this time. The back door back there is going to be our only exit point. So when service ends, we're going to ask that you go on and exit out the back door. And if you're going to want to talk to people, walk around and talk outside. Um, they say it's safer to be outside. The virus doesn't spread as easily outside. So if we're going to socialize with one another, let's do that outside rather than in here. So after the service is over, that's the exit point. These are going to be entrances only. And... Uh, that's main, the main thing that you need to know for the rest of the service today. Tell you what, uh, I have been in a battle, is my best way to explain it this week spiritually. Um, I've had stomach issues. Last night, I've had a multiple day headache that I'm, I'm guessing is a migraine. Uh, started Friday, uh, and it was, got really bad last night to the point that last night, every time I woke up, my head was pounding. And uh, I knew it was from the enemy. I knew he's just trying to get me not to sleep. I knew that he's just trying to get me not to deliver this message the way I believe God wants to deliver it today. Uh, I have written and rewritten and rewritten this message. I don't know how many times. Um, continue to, God continues to change a little bit about what I, I wanted to talk about. Um, because I think this is such an important moment for our church. I really do. This is... I, I was telling people during the pandemic, I feel like I'm planning a new church. I really do. And today's the first Sunday of this new church. Amen. So today's the day that we, as the members of Cornerstone Church, have to make a decision. Yeah. Not only members of Cornerstone Church, but members of the church in general, we have to make a decision, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. I hope I can remember how to preach, because I've gotten used to sitting in my chair with, since you couldn't see my, my pants, I had shorts on. Uh, I, was, I was wearing about what Randy wears to church every Sunday now. Um, had a t-shirt on, so let's see if I remember how to talk and, and walk at the same time uh, and stand at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's right. During the pandemic, you know, one thing that I kept hearing is that we want to get back to normal. And that was because our normal got messed up. What was normal for our life got messed up. Many people stopped working. Many people lost their jobs. Many people were laid off for a little bit of time. Kids couldn't go to school. And I know for you parents, I heard how rough that was. And the worst of all, at least for Randy Ramirez, is he couldn't go out to eat. <laughs> that was awful. Yes. Whoa. See, look, my mic even got louder talking about this. That's what God wants the restaurants back open too, I guess. Or Caleb does, more like Caleb. Um, everyone missed what normal looked like. That's what I kept hearing. I said, I can't wait to get back to normal. I can't wait till things get back to normal. And I think that's because anything other than normal makes us uncomfortable. Is that a word that could describe you during the pandemic was you were uncomfortable? And one thing Americans crave is comfort. One thing that we focus on is comfort, and we were not comfortable during the pandemic. I was reflecting on the kind of the timeline uh, of the pandemic, and 
and I was thinking that we went through stages. I saw different stages that, that we as people, and including myself, went through. The first week or two when they started shutting everything down, it wasn't that bad. We said, all right, they're going to shut them down for two weeks. I can live without restaurants for two weeks. I can, I can live with my kids for two weeks. Some even enjoyed being at home. Some enjoyed spending that time with their family. But then after a week or two passed, and the governor then decided to close us for another month, I saw fear and anxiety begin to sink in. I felt it within me. I saw it within you. Many families begin to ask, what are we going to do without income? What are we going to do during this? Are we going to be able to make it financially? Some parents were asking, how am I going to manage doing school with my children at home while also doing everything else that I'm supposed to do? As and then, of course, there was that question there is, am I or my family members going to get the virus? That fear and anxiety paralyze people. And I think, I'm, I think God's leading me this way next week to talk about the pandemic and how, what our response should be two times such as this but for the next month after uh, that week or two passed and for the next month uh, once the fear and anxiety kind of um, I don't know I don't know if it ever left us or if we just got tired of feeling it and so we got frustrated you begin to see people saying when is this going to end and you could tell the frustration in their voice that they were wanting to get back to normal. And so our emotions were running high. And about that time, the racial issues began to be on the forefront in our country. Emotions are already running up here. And then this happens. And it creates even more tension. creates any, even more problems. And, and, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that probably in two weeks. Is where God's, I think God's leading to me about the racial issues we're facing in our nation. But looking back, I just saw this perfect storm forming during the pandemic. And so after that next month passed or so, I see now that people are simply tired. That's the word I'm hearing now is I'm tired. I'm wore out. Many of us are going back to work, but we're going to back to work tired. We're going back to work, wore out. We spent a lot of emotional, mental, and physical energy during the pandemic. And I, I, I know that as we move back into some sense of normal, we desire some sense of comfort, too. And comfort comes from normalcy. And so when I think about a situation like this, God led me to this passage about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. I think about John chapter 21. When I think about today, when I think about where our church is at today, I thought about John chapter 21. And in John chapter 21, uh, we find that the disciples uh, had just been through a lot when you really think about it. The man that they had followed for, G for three years had just been put to death, but yet was raised to life, and he was no longer leading the disciples as normal. And so the disciples are at a point where they don't know what to do next. They're at a point where they are uncomfortable. And so it's no surprise to me to find them doing what I see them doing in John chapter 21. Let's read verses 1 through 3 as we get started here this morning. It says this, Later Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee, and this is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. And so Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they said. So they went out in the boat, and they caught nothing all night. 
It's no surprise to find, for me to find them when they are in an uncomfortable situation, just had been through a lot, they're tired and wore out because they've spent a lot of emotional and physical and mental energy during this time period. It's no surprise to me to find them going back to what they're comfortable with, and that was what was normal for them before they met Jesus. If you remember, and we're going to bring this up later, uh, when Jesus first encounters Peter, uh, well, really, when he calls Peter to be his, his disciple, uh, Peter is uh, fishing. That was what he did. He was a fisherman. And so it's no surprise for me to, to, to see Peter going back to what he's comfortable with, with what he knows how to do, with what is normal. And as we come back together as a church family, I know there is going to be a temptation for us to return to normal. I sense it. I see it. And I can tell you that this pastor's heart has been hurting because I know how strong that temptation is for us to return back to normal. Especially when it comes to to church there's going to be a temptation for church to return to normal because that is what we were comfortable with that is what we enjoyed but church do we really want to return to church as normal the more important question is this does God want us to return to church as normal Truthfully, it doesn't matter what you want. What matters is what God wants. If church history tells us anything, it's that God uses times such as this to teach the church what he desires for their new normal to be. And so today, I want us to make a decision. Are we going to settle for what has been normal for so long? Or are we going to follow God's leading heading into a new normal for our church? Here's my first point for you today. Normal is not what is needed. And I'm not going to bring up all the stats because we have covered them and covered them and covered them in multiple sermons in our church. But you know, and I don't think you even need to see the stats because for any of you that's been in church for any amount of time, you have seen that church attendance has been in regular decline. Just in my lifetime, church attendance has been in a regular decline. Statistics tells us that the number of practicing Christians is down to only 25% of Americans. And then we look around society, and we see society getting worse as well. That means the church is not being effective at what it's called to do. And so we see that things are getting worse. And in the church, I see that people are not living lives completely devoted to God. That's why you have these different denominations going all these different routes and believing all these false teachings and false things. Church, I don't want to go back to normal. I don't think God wants us to go back to normal because normal was not working. See, what happened, I think, is that we enjoyed normal because we were comfortable with it. But because we were so comfortable with it, we became complacent. We became apathetic. We settled. And I think, I think internally, at least in our minds, we knew that church as normal is not cutting it in the world today. But for some reason, we didn't act on that to develop a new normal, to go back to what Jesus called the church to do in the Word of God. We didn't change things. I tell you, I thought about this. If people in the community judged the church by its actions on whether we agreed with what was happening in the world today, what would they say was our belief? Many churches just hide and they're not trying to do anything about changing or, or working in the world today, trying to be more effective witness in the world today. 
Many churches don't even try to get out of normal church, even though they see it clearly is not working. It's not completing the mission that Jesus gave for us to make disciples. And so I think this passage in John chapter 21 is an excellent example for us for what the church has been dealing with for all these years, and especially during my lifetime. See, the disciples are experiencing normal. We already talked about how normal for them was fishing, and when we go back to when Jesus calls the first disciples, they are fishing. And Jesus tells them that he will make them fishers of men. And so for us, the church, we have interpreted that passage as fishing is a picture of what the church is called to do. The fish is the people. The fish are the people that we are called to reach. And so it's no surprise to me to find here in this specific passage, and I believe it's symbolic for the church, did you catch what it said in verse 3? So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing. These are professional professional fishers and fishermen, and they caught nothing all night. They went back to normal and caught nothing. In our normal, we were not catching like Jesus wants us to catch. The boat was barren, and I believe the church is barren. What they were doing was not producing what they wanted it to produce. Well, what the church was doing is not, was not producing what the church wanted it to produce. Yes, our church was growing. Yes, I'm thankful for that. We were growing numerically. But if I'm being honest with myself as a pastor, how are we doing making disciples? I don't think we were doing that great, just to be honest with you. We have a lot of work to do. And numbers, attendance numbers, mean nothing if you're not making disciples. I refuse to believe church as normal is what Jesus desires for the church. I believe that God wants to do more, and he is just waiting for people like me and you to be willing to learn, so he allows a pandemic to shut everything down, to stop us from meeting in a actual building, from meeting together, to make us realize a few things. And I think most of you have realized these things, but today is the day where we make the decision on whether we're going to change our actual actions following this, or are we going to go back to normal? The disciples are about to relearn a valuable lesson that I believe each one of us as individuals need to relearn as we move forward and as we prepare to make this, this decision. In verses 4 through 6, we are told that at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. And so Jesus called out, Fellas, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, Throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Did you see what happened there? Before Jesus got involved, he had nothing. That song we sang, Graven's Gardens. Our life was like a grave before Jesus. Life without Jesus is nothing but after Jesus got involved what happened they have an abundance of fish life with Jesus there's nothing more than you could ever want there's nothing more than you could ever need because Jesus is all we really need and so there's a lesson for each one of us as Christians as members of the church have we been trying to live life and be the church without Jesus. Because if you read how the church is described in the Bible, our churches don't look like that. 
Acts chapter 2, I, I was going to read the whole passage, but um, my sermon was a little long, so I cut it, cut it down. And, and really, I didn't cut it down because I'm using the same words, I'm just summarizing it, but it made me feel better. Uh, seeing 2,300 words versus 2,100 made me feel better. Um, we're told in Acts chapter 2 that the early church was devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to fellowship, prayer, performing miracles. They were sharing everything with one another, and they were praising God together daily. And Luke adds a little tidbit there at the end. He says, and the church grew daily. I wish the church would grow daily. And then look at what Jesus desired and declared in John chapter 17, verse 21. He says, I pray that they, talking about us, will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. He prayed that the church will be united as one, yet we can't even keep an tr individual church united. People fighting with one another. Denominations are formed. John 14, 12, he says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works. That's talking about us, that we're going to do greater works than Jesus. Because Jesus is going to the Father. We're not experiencing that church. At least we wasn't in normal. It wasn't when we were experiencing church as normal. And so when you look at what Scripture tells us about the church, we are not experiencing what Jesus desired, what God desires. And so that tells me that something has to be wrong. Have we been trying to do this without Jesus? I think we have. And that leads me to this next point. As we're making this decision today, Jesus has to drive our decision. Jesus has to drive our decision. This was the last change I made in the sermon, and it came to me yesterday because I thought about driving a car. The definition of drive, you know, we just say drive, but we don't even really think about the definition, at least I haven't. The definition of drive is to operate and control the direction and speed of a motor vehicle. So does the engine operate and control the direction and speed of a motor vehicle? No. Does the steering wheel? Just the direction, but it can't do it by itself. Some of them can, but most, most of us poor people can't afford that. Does the tires operate and control the direction and speed of the motor vehicle? No. Who drives the car? People. Human beings operate and control the direction and speed of a vehicle. We choose which direction the vehicle goes in. And so what I, what the, the picture that God has put in my head is that we, the people of God, have been driving the vehicle that we call the church. And we were never meant to drive. We're just the parts. We're the engine. We're the, we're the wheels. We're the steering wheel. But Jesus is the driver. God is the driver. We should look to God to direct us and to and really empower us. Uh, that, that analogy falls apart because Jesus is the one who empowers us to do the work. He is the engine. He is everything. But we are called to be a part of that as well because we are the body of Christ. But Jesus is the one who is supposed to direct the church in the direction it needs to head in. And so church... Today, we've got to start letting Jesus drive. We've got to give up the steering wheel and say, God, we're going to do what you tell us to do. We're going to go to what the Word tells us to do. We're going to follow your Holy Spirit's leadings to tell us what to do. We're going to let you drive, and we're just going to follow. Another analogy is that Jesus is the head of the church. Your body is going to be pretty useless without the head. The head, <laughs> the head goes off, nothing else works. And so we're told in Colossians 1.18, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. So here's what's been happening. We've been trying 
to be the body without the head. We've been trying to be the body without the part that tells the rest of the body what to do. And it's not that there's a problem with the head. It's not that the head left us. It's that there's a disconnection. Because we're not spending time with God like we should. We're not seeking Him like we should. We were never meant to direct ourselves what to do. Because that's what our old life looked like. And that led to death and destruction. We live to do what the head tells us to do. And we as the church need to start letting the head lead us. But that starts with each individual of the church letting Jesus drive their life. And letting Jesus drive their decisions. We're focusing on this one decision today let Jesus drive every decision that we make how often do we actually seek Jesus to give us direction with making our daily decisions not often if we would I can guarantee you we would see a lot more fruit coming from the church if we would I guarantee you that this church will be making more disciples than we ever have before if we would allow Jesus to drive our daily decisions I think we would see a revival break out a great awakening take place evil be pushed back and so what we must do to make sure that Jesus drives our daily decisions is we must direct our attention towards him. We must go to him for direction. And so that's where we come into spending time with Jesus. We are encouraging the church to participate in our Bible readings because this is one avenue in which we experience God's presence. We always you know, I think people, people always desire for God to speak to them, but they never pick up the word that Jesus speaks to them in. I think people would be amazed to hear the voice of God, but they never open to hear the voice of God in these pages. And so we should be spending more time with Jesus so that he will direct our decisions and and i'm thankful that our church has participated we've had a pretty good turnout uh participating in our bible readings and i hope that if you're not that you will start participating and that you will start participating with one another to discuss it because god can use other people to help you realize something that maybe you didn't realize in his word and i hope that you're praying more often i hope that we as a church will pray more often together I hope that we will seek his guidance in every situation. And church, I can tell you, he will give it if we listen. He will give it if we build that connection, if we direct our attention towards him. Church, I am begging you, begging you, don't go back to how you were before because you were not directing much of your attention towards him. Just to be honest with you. And even if you think that you were, do more. And we'll see God do something here. Peter's about to let Jesus drive his decision, and there's a lesson in here for us um, that we need to understand as we make this decision and every decision. Because you remember Peter, uh, Jesus told Peter his calling was that he was going to be the rock of the church. That he was going to be the rock that the church was built on. But I see, I think Peter knows his calling, and I think we know our calling, which is to be a disciple of Jesus, and to be, and we've talked about during our Church 3.0 series, to be a priest, to do ministry work. We know our calling, but there's a side of Peter, just like there's a side to us, that wants to return to normal. 
And so Peter had to make a make decision. Was he going to return to normal or was he going to develop a new normal by following Jesus? And so Jesus is about to lead him through the process of making that decision. But notice that Peter has directed his focus towards Jesus so that he can drive this decision. So I'm going to summarize a few verses here. So basically what happens is after they catch an abundance of fish, then they recognize Jesus. That's interesting there, that they recognize Jesus by the abundance. They recognize Jesus by the abundance of fish. So John recognizes Jesus. Peter, who is naked in the boat, puts his clothes on, and he then swims to Jesus, thankfully. Uh, and, he's, and then Jesus spends some time with his disciples eating breakfast together. I would love to have breakfast with Jesus, wouldn't you? Then Jesus proceeds to ask Peter some questions, which I believe shows what God ultimately desires from us and for us. And, and I believe that um, these questions that Jesus asked Peter tells us an important part an important part of the formula in which our decisions should be made with. It says, after breakfast, in verse 15, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? So there is debate on what these are. So these could be the other disciples. So do you love me more than these other disciples do? I don't really think Jesus is going to ask him that because that's kind of like leading him into a prideful situation. But I think that when you think about they had just caught an abundance of fish, they had hauled the net up there, they had just ate some fish because Jesus already had the fish waiting for them when, before they even got up to him. And then they brought more fish. I think that, that Jesus is having this conversation with Peter and those fish are scattered all throughout the ground there and he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And another way of saying that, that is, do you love me more than doing what is your normal? Do you love me more than fishing? Do you love me more from your old life? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. So there's a hint here in the scripture that really makes me think that the disciples had went back to their old way of living. Jesus changed Peter's name from Simon to Peter. But did you notice what name he used in this situation? Simon, his old name. Jesus says, hey, you went back to how you used to be. You went back to your old ways. You went back to normal. And so, Simon, do you, do you love me? Do you love me more than returning to fishing or more than normal? Jesus is asking Peter if Peter loves him and when you really think about it, and we talked about this a little bit on Friday night in our Zoom call, that ultimately is what Christianity is about, is loving God and loving others. It's about love. But we in the church have made Christianity or following God about all about these, all these other things. But really, as we are at this point of making the decision on whether to move into a new normal or a new season or not, it comes down to this. This is another key part of the formula. We've got to let Jesus drive our decision, but our decision, and not only this decision, but every decision, our decision must come from a heart of love. Jesus is asking Peter, Peter, do you love me? Because if you love me, then feed my sheep. Then go away from what you want to do. Go away from your normal and go to what I've called you to do. Your new normal. Develop a new normal in your life. And so our decision and every decision must come from a heart of love. 
This goes back to what Jesus said in Matthew 22, 36. Someone asked Jesus, he said, Teacher, who is the most important command, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and then in other, other versions that say with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. And in this translation on the screen, it says equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So Jesus said, if you want to summarize what, what being a follower of God is about, if you want to summarize everything God desires from us, those are the two greatest commandments to love God with all of who you are and to love others as yourself. And so when we think about what God is calling us to do as the church, when we think about what God is calling you to do as individuals, it comes down to that. He is calling us to love. Every decision we make needs to come from a heart of love. But we've made it in the church about all these other things, about coming to church and sitting in these seats. We've made it about um, praying and reading your Bible daily. We tell them that's what a Christian, good Christian does. And then we tell them not to do certain things. You don't do this, you don't do that, you don't do this. We focused on the wrong things. What we should be teaching our people and what we should be encouraging our people is to show your love for God and others in everything you do. And if we encourage and make that the focus, everything I just said is going to follow. But we've made it, I remember how to preach, I think. We, we've made it about all these other things. And so as we move forward, we have to make it about love. We have to make it about love. Amen. And so we have to love God. I know that that side of us, and, and, and for some reason during worship, and I have not thought about it until like this until during worship, the devil wants us to go back to normal. And here I have that our flesh is going to want one thing and the spirit's going to want another. The flesh is going to want us to go back to normal because that is what is comfortable. But God was leading me to tell you today the devil wants you to go back to normal. I don't think he was all that afraid of the church beforehand. If you love God... You're going you're gonna to go to God for guidance, and you're going to let Jesus drive your decision. You're going to direct your attention towards him, and you're going to follow the Spirit's leading. We must want to do what God wants. That's what it means to love God. It might not be convenient for you to do some of the things that God is leading you to do. But because you love God, you do what God tells you to do over what you want to do. So our love must be characterized by three things, and these were three of my core points, and I've just made them sub-points because God continued to lead me in a different direction. So I'm going I'm to fly through this pretty quick. But our love must be characterized by three things. The first thing is humility. Verse 16 says, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. See, we don't get this in the English translation as good as you would in the original uh, language, but Jesus is using a higher form of the word love when he asks Simon these first two questions. It's an agape love always been viewed as a higher love and Peter doesn't respond that he loves Jesus in terms of agape love he loves Jesus in a lower form of love which is a love that one has for a friend and this is coming from Peter who tends to think more highly of himself than he should 
He told Jesus, I'm not going to deny you. Everyone else will, and I'm not going to. And then he was the first one that did. And so we see that Peter has humbled himself. His love that he is now showing to Jesus is coming from a heart of, of humility. It's so a church, as we um, are making our daily decisions and as we're making this decision, our love must be characterized by humility. And humility says, my way is not best, God's way is best. And I'm going to sacrifice my way for his way to follow the way. In the church and in your life, you have thought that you knew best. When we talk about in the church, I think that human beings have been leading the church for far too long doing what we think is best rather than what Scripture tells us to do. We've been running the church more like a business than the body of Jesus. You've been making decisions based off what you want, what you think is best, when you should be doing what God thinks is best. Have that uh, love that is characterized by humility. Sacrifice your way to follow the way. Second thing our love has to be characterized by is dependence. Verse 17. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked this question a third time, and he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I love that he says, Lord, you know everything. And every time uh, that he, Jesus asked Peter that question, he says, you know that I love you. He's not leaning on his own understanding of his love for God because he knows that Jesus knows if he really does love him or not. So he's showing dependence on God. And so as we make our decisions, we need God's help. We need to go to God to make this decision. We need to be dependent on God. And when I thought about um, what this dependence on God should lead us to do, it should lead to desperation. And in our church, in your life, are you really desperate for God? Or are you just living life however you think is best? Are you spending time with God saying, God, speak to me. God, lead me. God, I'm crying out to you. How desperate are we? I've not seen that desperation in the church. I've not seen that desperation in our lives. And this love that we must use to make our decisions, must have to make our decisions, must be characterized by a desperation because we know that we are dependent on God. We need God. Before the pandemic started, before they closed everything down we were in John chapter 15 and Jesus said you can do nothing without me we think we can because if we knew that we couldn't we would spend more time with him third thing it must be characterized by is obedience when God leads we follow Jesus goes on, and I'm not going to read the verses to you, but Jesus goes on and he tells Peter basically how he's going to die. He says, as a child, you did what you wanted to do. Someone dressed you, or now someone's going to dress you. And basically it's referring to Peter dying. He said, before you got to do what you wanted to do, but now you're not. And because you're going to follow me, because you're going to live a life obedient to me, it's going to, you're going to have to give up your life, essentially. Church, we are called to live holy lives. We're called to give up our old lives. We're called to give up normal for what God wants for us. This love must be characterized by obedience, and that leads right to my next point. Our love must lead to action, which is seen in loving other people. Each time Peter answered Jesus' question with his decision, Jesus responded with a command, and that command was to take action. 
That command was to feed Jesus' sheep. That command was to take care of Jesus' people. And so the love that is in our heart should push us to care for other people. The love that is in our heart should lead us to sacrifice for others. That love should lead us to spend more time with our fellow Christians. That love should lead us to make disciples. Church, we've got to do better at this. Category five, right now. The word I heard this past Sunday on Zoom when the leaders asked, what are you going to change coming out of this pandemic? I heard the word intentional I don't know how many times. Everyone said, I'm going to be more intentional. And that encouraged this pastor's heart. I said, you know what? Maybe our people aren't going back to normal. Maybe they'll be intentional about loving others. Maybe they'll be intentional about spending more time with their fellow believers. Maybe they'll be more intentional about prayer. Maybe they'll be more intentional about spending more time with God. But all I've seen past, past week is anything but intentionality. I heard that some of our Bible study groups are falling off. That people are not participating. We had a prayer walk last Sunday where we had the opportunity to tell our community that the church is still united. That the church is working together. And as far as I know, three people from our church showed up. We had a Zoom gathering Friday night, and I was so discouraged to look through my photos the other day from one of our first Zoom gatherings, and we had more people than could fit on the screen, and on Friday night, we had, I think, 15. We have less people involved in our Zoom gatherings than we did when we had in-person gatherings, and Zoom should be a whole lot more easier than in-person. We made it as easy as possible for you. You do it at home. Saturday morning feeding, I can count on one hand how many people have helped us, two hands, how many people have helped us on Saturday mornings. We've been feeding for three months. I can count on one hand how many people have come to pray on Saturday morning from 11 to 1 like we've been encouraging the church to do for the last three weeks. We had about 20 adults show up last night for our prayer gathering. Where is the intentionality in that? I'm saying this from a heart of love. I thought about today's Father's Day, and sometimes the father has to use the rod. This is the rod. Where's the intentionality? I've been hurting this week. My heart has been hurting because I see that we are slipping back into normal. Normal wasn't cutting it. So today we have a decision. Are we going to go back to normal or move forward in what Jesus desires for us? July 8, 2010, ESPN did a special, and they called it The Decision. They're going to put a picture of LeBron James up on the screen. This is one of the biggest decisions in the NBA, even though he's made it two more times because he can't stay on one team. <laughs> LeBron's a top ten player, maybe, all time in the NBA. I know I'm going to get pushed back on that from my young guys. This was the decision. 
And I thought about naming today's message the decision. 13.1 million people tuned in to watch LeBron decide where he was going to play next year. 13.1 million viewers. It was a big moment for the NBA. It was a big moment for really America. But this moment is bigger than that. 7.6 billion people are watching to see the decision that the church is going to make coming out of this pandemic. 15,000 plus people in this area who don't know Jesus is watching the decision that this church, Cornerstone Church, is going to make coming out of this pandemic. How many people are watching the decision you as an individual are going to make? Because the decision that you make today is going to positively or negatively affect all the people around you. If you decide that normal was not cutting it, you're going to positively affect other people's lives like you never have before. But if you go back to normal, nothing is going to change, and there's going to be more people in our community that God has placed us near, more people in your life that God has placed you near who are going to die and head to hell because you chose to do what was comfortable for you. Today, is the beginning of a new day for our church. What is your decision going to be? Going back to normal? Or are you going to let Jesus drive this decision? And not only this decision, but all decisions going forward. Church, my prayer this morning is that you would make this decision out of a heart of love. A love for God and a love for others with the understanding that God loves you so much and he desires so much more for, for you than normal. And so what's your decision going to be? Continue with normal or develop a new normal? We're going to have an altar call and we're not going to worry about social distancing there it? I believe there's three ways you can respond. Number one, you can repent for settling for normal. Number two, you can ask God to drive your decision and your daily decisions. And number three, maybe you're struggling with the love for him and others, and so maybe you, can, maybe you need to ask God to teach you how to love him and others better, knowing that he will teach you that. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to respond. Go and stand to your feet.